remembering, O oh God, a world that is being torn apart as we worship this morning. May these words fall fresh on us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In the name of the triune God, in and all, through all, and in all. Amen. Please be seated. If you feel as though your head is spinning a bit after hearing the gospel this morning, I think you're probably in good company. This is another parable or short story that Jesus tells to make a point. Remember, parables aren't real. They are made up, but nonetheless, they serve a purpose using notions and ideas that are absolutely exaggerated and preposterous to make a point. That is what a parable is. Jesus uses them often when he teaches. And personally, I just feel that they are ways um, that make Jesus quite clever. And we, get to, we catch a glimpse of just how clever he is. Remember, many times he uses parables when in company of those who were out to get him or to trip him up, primarily the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Some parables are a little bit easier to understand than others, like this morning. I would categorize this morning's parable as a little bit more difficult to understand. It is a peculiar story that doesn't leave the hearer feeling all warm and fuzzy on the inside, does it? In fact, feelings are evoked that are probably quite the opposite. So what do we do with passages like this? They are in the gospel text. We can't ignore them. The lectionary won't let us, dadgummit. <laughs> as much as I would like that, they are present. Well, firstly... I think it's perfectly well and good to acknowledge that we are rightly mystified by the behavior of the characters in this story. An initial invitation to come to a feast in honor of the king's son is firstly met with rejection. And for considering for that time, that's quite odd because nobody at that time turned down a royal summons to a party. A second invitation sweetens the deal with descriptions of the elaborate preparations, including oxen and cattle, scrumptious. Who wouldn't want to come to a party with fattened oxen and cattle on the menu? But those invited are apparently completely unimpressed, so they return to business as usual. Again, this is really unusual behavior, but it's the kind of strangeness we have learned to expect in a parable. But then things go completely off the rails. We watch in horror as the servants sent by the king to announce the party, they're seized, they're abused, and then they are murdered. Did you see that coming? How did the stakes get so high? And the weirdness and the violence just is getting started. In retaliation, the king goes to war against his own people. Enraged by their actions, he unleashes an army. And before we know it, the murderers themselves are murdered, and the king's own city is a pile of smoldering ash. We're not done. The story gets a little stranger. With our heads still spinning, we learn that the dinner is still on. The banquet is still going to happen. 
the invitations go out again. This time, though, to commoners on the main streets of the city that has just been obliterated. And as soldiers pillage and destroy, we learn that food for the banquet is still being cooked, prepared, and kept warm for the guests of the party. If this sounds absurd, it should be. It's a parable. But wait, we're still not done. With the party in full swing, the king throws open the banquet doors, comes in, and to his chagrin, finds that one of his party goers, who really wasn't even invited to the party, isn't dressed properly. This enrages the king. And so he says, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? Receiving no satisfactory answer, he has the man bound, thrown out, and not just outside the hall, but into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Seriously, this seems a bit extreme, doesn't it? Of course this man wasn't dressed for a party. He was literally pulled off the street at the last minute and told, come to the king's party. Preposterous, exaggerated, another parable. How could a king expect for someone off the streets to be properly dressed for a royal party? Well, that's the way the story ends. No real sense of redemption. So you tell me, as a preacher, how do you find good news? How does one find gospel in the midst of this parable? Again, this is a strange and disturbing story. But after sitting with it, in some measure, I do believe it points to something that is worth saying. Will you give it a chance? Here's my best guess. At this particular time in the telling of the story, remember, there wasn't a message, there wasn't an understanding that the message of God was for everyone. It was for very few select people. However, in this story, although disturbing to say the least, the king, he invites. He invites those to the banquet that he thought would come firstly. But they didn't. And so he invited again. And this time, he invited every single person. He invited everyone. Okay. So you might ask, well, Mother Suzanne, what does that mean for me? How do I make sense of that in my life and in the context of what is going on in the world right now? And this is where it's helpful for me to pull back from the story just a bit and to recognize what the overarching message, what is being communicated. In light of what is going on in the world this week, if you've been under a rock, another war has begun. There have already been so many who have died. So much destruction has already happened. Ironically, in the area of the world where this parable was first spoke. There is a sense that both sides, yes, both sides, as hard as it is to comprehend in our own minds, are loved deeply by God. 
This is difficult for me to preach. This is difficult for me to write and think about, but it has to be said as a reminder to us all that this is where God lands in the midst of these situations that are so far beyond comprehension. God continues to invite all of his creation to himself, whatever and whichever side one is on. As disciples of Jesus, regardless of how layered and dismal the story may sound or the world may feel at this particular moment, as strange as it may be, I believe there are hopeful words in this text. Despite the absurdities and the peculiarity, it speaks now, perhaps now more than ever. God is in all, working all together for good. And if we pull back, no matter how bad things seem or feel, God is continually calling his creation to himself, good and bad, rich and poor, because God is a God of expansive love, radical inclusiveness and gracious hospitality. It never ends, whether there is a war going on or not. For we will see even in the midst of turmoil and war, even in that God is beckoning his creation to him. His gospel message, his good news is for all. We see that in this story, in this parable, the banquet is laid out extravagantly for every single person who comes or in our context, in our world today, regardless of which side you find yourself on. And bringing it even closer to home, for those who have never been invited or thought about, when they finally get to partake, when they finally get the invitation from the king for a new way, it is life-changing. I caught a glimpse of that on Friday afternoon with our dear Lupe Ramirez. Lupe is a man who came to Grace several years back by way of our mobile food pantry. He was our director of traffic, and he did it really well. And the more he came on Thursday because he felt included and welcome, we slowly began to see how every single time the doors of this place were open, Lupe was here. In fact, in the horrific winter storm of 2021, it was Lupe who discovered that our parish hall was completely underwater. He loved being here. He loved being in this place because he was accepted, he was welcomed, and he was loved. Unlike any other place or group of people he had ever known. He had never felt that before coming here. So while at the same time he's experiencing this radical inclusion and love by a church, Lupe was also undergoing his own serious health struggles. Ed and I went to see Lupe in the hospital on Friday afternoon, and for those of you all who don't know, his heart is functioning at 20%, and his congestive heart failure has basically taken over. Lupe's sister, Lucia, greeted us and described how 
all day on Friday, if there was any moment when Lupe was alert, because he's now in and out of sleep, all Lupe could talk about was grace. Can you imagine? Every word out of that man's mouth was grace and how much he loved this place, how it had changed him, how much he missed it and wished for one more time to worship here. Over and over he recounted his love for this place, the place that welcomed him and showed him what unconditional love is like. His sister went on to explain how at the end of his life, finally, finally, she says, he had found a place that saw him for the good person he is and offered him the grace that he so desperately needed. So prayers, the sacrament of the body and blood of Jesus, as well as the anointing, were graciously given to our friend Lupe. And I reminded him with all of that, the presence of Grace Episcopal Church, his church family was right there in the room with him. And as we left, he opened his eyes his face brightened, and all he had the strength to say was thank you. When Jesus uses a parable to teach, his main desire is for the kingdom of God to be made known. That's the thing, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, it's all around us. It happens when we're open, when we allow God's spirit of invitation, welcome, and hospitality of grace to come in, when we pray for those who are caught up in war and its ravages, and trust that somehow God is in the midst offering peace, offering balm to those who are in great anguish. The kingdom of God comes when we care enough for the suffering of others to interrupt our own lives so that we can then offer some measure of comfort and peace to them. The act of soothing another person's sorrow, that is a sacrament. When we remember those who are never invited or seldom invited, and we extend a gracious act of welcome and invitation, not just once, but we make it a habit. We do it over and over and over again so that for once, those who have gone without for so long can experience something new. They can experience what community and family means. So much so that when they are on their deathbed, they call to mind where they've experienced that. Because for them, it is God's kingdom. It is heaven on earth for them. So this morning, however you come and whatever you bring, the sorrow, the joy, all of it, you've arrived for a banquet. And as your priest, I would be remiss if I did not tell you it is laid out for you. However you show up, Whatever clothes you have on and the baggage you bring, it's for you. The king has invited. 
He's glad you've come. The banqueting table will be spread just for you, and the radical, gracious hospitality of God will be on full display. Just say yes. Be fed and receive the greatest gift of all. You've come to the right place. And mostly, by saying yes, you've said yes to his invitation of love and forgiveness. In the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.